Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard, and this video is sponsored by The MathWorks, the creators of MATLAB and Simulink. I've been using their tools for almost five years now, and if you'd like access to any of the models or simulations we build today, those are linked for free in the description down below. Building a good model is maybe 90% of the work of building a good control system. Before we focus on PID or state feedback, anything that closes the loop in our system, we need to focus on the open loop dynamics of the rocket. What happens if we give it any arbitrary force? So we're gonna set up that simulation today. Before we do, we need to build the rocket and take some measurements. To start off with a bit about the rocket, I built it using regular old Signal R2 parts. We're gonna use a regular 74 millimeter thrust vector control mount in a 74 millimeter airframe. I'll also use the signal computer inside the vehicle and we'll neglect parachutes or anything like that for now. We have a little ways to go until we start flying. Before we jump into the simulation side, I wanna talk about one measurement we have to take called the mass moment of inertia. I have two similarly sized tubular objects here, one of them being very hollow and cardboard, the other not and quite heavy. This object, if I hold it by its center of mass and I give it a tiny little tap, it's very, very easy for it to move around. And because the density on this object is much, much higher, and it, because of where we have mass on the vehicle here too, which is lots of mass down here, lots of mass up here, it's much more difficult for this vehicle to move around when I give it a tap. And so this would have a much higher mass moment of inertia. It's not really about the mass, it's about the density across the vehicle. Okay, sidebar over, let's get some measurements. We're gonna do all these measurements with a loaded motor that is ready to fly. This one has some hot glue just for safety. I'm gonna start off by taking the mass of the vehicle with the scale, and I'm gonna write all these things down on a piece of paper for future reference. When I weigh the vehicle, it comes out to just about 543 grams. So I'll write that down on the paper, taking care to notate it as kilograms, not grams. This will help us a little bit later. Next up, I'm gonna find the center of mass in the vehicle by using my finger and seeing where it balances. Once I've found the center of mass, I'm gonna mark it with a piece of blue tape and a dot. Next up, I'm gonna use the tape measure to put two points 30 centimeters away from the center of mass on the vehicle. 30 centimeters is a bit of an arbitrary measurement, but just go with it for now. At these points, I'm gonna tie around two strings, and that's what we're gonna hang the vehicle from when we do this test. I'll also notate all of this down as COM to string, being 0.3 meters. Now it's time to hang the rocket. I'll take care here to make sure that the hang points on the table are in line with the hang points on the vehicle. When we hang the rocket on the strings, the strings should be parallel. I'll mount the rocket at each one of the hang points and secure it with the clamp. Then I'll take care to make sure that the rocket is even with the table and ground below it. Now that we've got our rocket hung, it's time to measure the length of the string. I'll measure the length of the string going from the table down to the center of mass on the long axis of the vehicle, not necessarily the exact attachment point. I'll write this down as string len because apparently I didn't wanna say length and that's 0.65 meters. Finally, I wanna measure the moment arm of the vehicle, which is the distance between the attachment point of the thrust vector control mount and the center of mass where the vehicle will naturally rotate about. Using a tape measure, this comes out to be about 28 centimeters, which I'll notate down once again in meters as 0.28 meters. The next thing we wanna do is rotate this rocket about its center of mass and then measure the period of the oscillation that happens. And the way I'm gonna do this and get an accurate measurement is I'm going to use the timer on my phone to time the average of 10 oscillations. I'll show you how that works here. First, I'll place my finger at the center of mass, then I'll give the vehicle a small push in one direction, let go, and make sure that this dot right here isn't moving too much. It's moving a little bit here, so let me try this again. I'll place my finger at the CM, give it a little bit of a push, try to keep it right in one place, and this looks like a better rotation. So now we're gonna time the average of 10 of these oscillations from peak to peak. So I'll call this right here the peak when the vehicle comes toward me at the top. So here we go, peak. And this is one full oscillation, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Peak to peak, which took 1.603 seconds on average for each peak. And what I did there is I just moved the decimal point one to the left because we took 10 oscillations, we're getting the average of that, and that's going to be our rotation time. So 1.603.
Now we can convert these measurements into the vehicle's mass moment of inertia. We multiply the vehicle mass by the gravitational constant. That gets multiplied by the rotation time squared multiplied by the distance between the center of mass and the string squared. This is all over four pi squared multiplied by the length of the string from the table to the vehicle. The resulting value from this equation is 0.048 kilogram meters squared. So armed with this value and our moment arm, which is 0.28 meters, we can bring it into Simulink. So let's get started. And in the interest of simplicity, we're going to start with a somewhat built model and then build on top of it as we go along. So here's what I've got right here. Let's take a look at this big center block to start with. This is the three DOF block or three degrees of freedom. This block represents all of the complicated nonlinear equations of motion and it makes it very easy for us so we can just plug in forces on different axes and out comes our angle, our angular velocity, position, velocity, acceleration, everything that we're really interested in. And if I open this block up by double clicking on it, you can see we've got a bunch of settings we can mess with. Our initial velocity, our initial orientation, initial position, all of these things that we could change. I'm only gonna change two for now. That's going to be our initial mass, which I'll set as 0.543. Remember that's the 543 grams that we weighed on the rocket. And our inertia, which was 0.048 kilogram meters squared. Uh, and so those are the units that these boxes take. With changing those, we're all set in this block. Over on the left here, I've got a small discrete step function. This just represents a 15 Newton thrust for two seconds and then shuts off. There's no fancy thrust curve here. We're just representing a small amount of thrust for some nominal amount of time. Coming over on the right here, I've got the position coming out of the block and then using the DMUX block, I split this signal into two different things. One of them being the X axis, that's the horizontal axis. One of them being the Z axis, which is vertical. You'll also note that I've got a negative one gain here and this is just inverting the signal that comes out of this block and that has to do with the inherent coordinate frame this block likes to work in. All the way over on the right here, I've got these two different scopes and let's go ahead and open one up. Let's start with this one here, which I've named Z position and this is going to represent our altitude. So when I click the run button, it's going to run that thrust curve through this three DOF block and then we're gonna get our altitude for the whole flight. So here we go. And look at that, we hit just about 100 meters on this flight. Now, a couple of obvious things. We're not simulating wind, we're not simulating drag. Everything is very, very basic right now, but this is a good jumping off point to get started with. I can also visualize the flight data as a trajectory, which I've got right here in a little plot. You can see we don't translate downrange at all. We just go up and then straight back down. So let's make this a little bit more fancy and add some thrust vector control stuff. Moving over to the left here, I've already got a block set up called gimbal angle. You can see I've got a little slider here as well which if I click on it, lets me drag the gimbal back and forth to different amounts of degrees in its mount. I'm gonna take this thrust signal, I'm gonna disconnect it from the three DOF block and just move it over here for simplicity. And then let's add two more blocks, sine and cosine. What we're about to do here is called vector resolution. If you've been through a traditional high school trigonometry class, you've probably done this before. We're going to find out the individual force components when we have some gimbal angle, and that's gonna result in some amount of force upward and some amount of force to the side. So our gimbal angle here is in degrees, and we need to convert that to radians for these blocks to work. So let's do that with the deg to rad block. Here we go, degrees to radians. I'll put that right in front of the gimbal angle block, and then we'll feed it into the cosine block so we can take the cosine of that. We're also going to take the sine of the gimbal angle, and that's going to help us resolve the horizontal axis of things. Next up, we need to take these sine and cosine values and multiply them by the thrust. So I'll get two little multiplication blocks in here, and we'll add them in. Then we're going to connect cosine and sine up to their respective blocks, and each one will then be multiplied by the thrust that's coming out of our little thrust block. And in fact, I can probably simplify this signal a little bit more by putting it there. So we've got a chunk of blocks here, and this feels like a good time for a quick review. First, we start off with our gimbal angle, and that gets set with our little slider here. That's set in degrees, so we convert that from degrees to radians, so it'll work with these sine and cosine blocks. On the bottom, we have cosine. So we take the cosine of the gimbal angle, and multiply that by our thrust. And that is gonna give us our total vertical force on the vehicle. So we can actually take this opportunity to connect this 
with the z-axis and just put our vertical force into the three doth block. Up here though, we have the sine where we take the sine of the gimbal angle and multiply by the thrust and that gives us the total horizontal force on the mount of the rocket. So we can connect this up with the x-axis to give us the total horizontal force of the vehicle, but we have to do one more thing. Right now, both of these signals are in newtons and not newton meters or torque units. And when we actuate that thrust vector control mount, what we're really doing is creating torques on the vehicle. And those are a direct function of how long that moment arm is. So it's very simple. What I'm gonna do is add another multiplication block here. Then I'm gonna hook it up to the horizontal force that we got by doing the sine of the gimbal angle multiplied by the thrust. And finally, I'll multiply that by our moment arm. To do this, I'll add a constant block right here. I'll go ahead and name this moment arm. And then we have to change it to the correct value, which was 0.28. That's 28 centimeters, but we need it in meters. So there we go. We'll hook it up here. And then finally, we've converted this force into a torque, which is in Newton meters, which we can connect up right there. So now with all of this, we should have a good simulation and let's give it a shot. I'll open up the Z position scope here, which is again, just our altitude and let's run the simulation. Okay, here we go. We're getting up to 100 meters again, so that's still working. But what do you think would happen if I changed the gimbal angle to some constant number of degrees? Well, this rocket is very light and the inertia is very, very low. So why don't I just change it a little bit? I'll go up to, I don't know, that looks like about a third of a degree, maybe a quarter of a degree. Let me open up that Z scope again and we'll run it. Looks like we're getting just about 85 meters out of this. So we've lowered our altitude because of that gimbal angle. The rocket is probably flipping out of control or turning over quite a bit. So let's look at a different scope right here. And you can see our trajectory. This is the vehicle moving downrange because of that gimbal angle. This is a very sensitive rocket because of how light it is. Again, I have no parachutes on here. So this makes quite a bit of sense to me. Just to show that it's working, I can move this gimbal angle in the other direction. I'll move it just a little bit so we have a very slight downrange pitch. Let me open up the trajectory scope again and let's run it. There we go, so we're still going up pretty high. You can see the trajectory slowly change as we arc over to fall back down. This is what our flight path would look like if we had a misalignment uh, of just this much in our thrust vector control mount. So this is where we're at. This is a good simulation that can help us get a sense for how high this rocket is gonna fly, how far we can pitch down range. If you wanted a higher fidelity model, you could also use Simscape with something like this. So you don't just get plots, but you have an idea of what the rocket will look like in flight. I've got a little STL file right here, rocket.stl that represents the vehicle. And when I go back into the main model and hit run, it's gonna take these physics from the plots and everything we've seen and show us a visualization of what the flight will look like. And of course, what you could do is you could generate the actual STL of the rocket you're trying to fly and get a much more accurate simulation of what your rocket is gonna look like in the air. Closing the loop is its own whole can of worms, so we won't get into PID controllers or some of the more nuanced thrust vector control stuff today. But if you'd like to see a video like that, please let me and or MathWorks know. I like doing these videos and they're a lot of fun. As I mentioned before, if you'd like to try these simulations out for yourself, they are linked for free in the description down below. Feel free to use it for your own stuff or try it out and let me know what you think. And that's all I have for you today. So thanks for watching. Thanks again to MathWorks for sponsoring this video and may your skies be blue and your winds be low.